Welcome to this online deputation meeting of the Trinitarian Bible Society. In this presentation, we will begin with a message from Holy Scripture before sharing updates of the Amharic and Chichewa translations. There will also be an update on our Spanish distribution work in South America and some brief notices and prayer requests. Let us begin with prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank Thee that we can approach Thee this day. What a mercy it is that Thou, the Holy God of Heaven, should bid us, the fallen sons of Adam's sinful race, entrance into Thy holy court. We rejoice in the One who has made it all possible. We thank Thee for a Saviour who has come into this world and lived that perfect life of obedience that we could not live and died that atoning death on the cross that we deserve to die. We thank thee for a saviour who is risen and ascended and seated at thy right hand where he ever lives to make intercession for his beloved people. And as we come before thee this day, we thank thee for the holy scriptures. We rejoice that thou hast given us thy word that we are able to read so that we can know thee and know the way of salvation and so that we can live according to thy holy law. And we come today and thank thee for the work of the Trinitarian Bible Society, for calling this organisation into being, for keeping it and preserving it and blessing it over these many years. And we commit the many needs of the Society unto thee this day, praying that the translators will know thy help as they translate thy word. Pray if it be thy will, that thou would raise up more translators to translate thy word into the many needed languages of the world. And we pray for thy blessing upon the word of God as it is distributed throughout the world, that thou would help those who distribute it, and that thou would even enable us to distribute more copies of thy word in the days to come, if it be thy will. So, Father, we pray for thy blessing upon this online deputation meeting here today, that thou would be pleased to be glorified even through the sharing uh, of this work. So forgive and pardon every sin, we pray, and love us freely, for we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Our scripture reading is from Isaiah chapter 40, verses 1 to 12. Comfort ye, comfort ye, my people, saith your God. Speak ye comfortably to Jerusalem, and cry unto her, that her warfare is accomplished, that her iniquity is pardoned. For she hath received of the Lord's hand double for all her sins. The voice of him that crieth in the wilderness, Prepare ye the way of the Lord. Make straight in the desert a highway for our God. Every valley shall be exalted, and every mountain and hill shall be made low, and the crooked shall be made straight, and the rough places plain. And the glory of the Lord shall be revealed, and all flesh shall see it together, for the mouth of the Lord hath spoken it. The voice said, Cry, and he said, What shall I cry? All flesh is grass, and all the goodliness thereof is as the flower of the field. The grass withereth, the flower fadeth, because the Spirit of the Lord bloweth upon it. Surely the people is grass. The grass withereth, the flower fadeth, but the word of our God shall stand for ever. O Zion, that bringest good tidings, get thee up into the high mountain. O Jerusalem, that bringest good tidings, lift up thy voice with strength. Lift it up, be not afraid. Say unto the cities of Judah, Behold your God. Behold, the Lord God will come with strong hand, and his arm shall rule for him. Behold, his reward is with him, and his work before him. He shall feed his flock like a shepherd. He shall gather the lambs with his arm and carry them in his bosom and shall gently lead those that are with young. Who hath measured the waters in the hollow of his hand and meted out heaven with a span and comprehended the dust of the earth in a measure and weighed the mountains in scales and the hills in a balance. Amen. Thus ends the reading of God's precious word. According to Matthew Henry, Hosea was the first prophet to record his prophecy, followed by Joel, Amos and Obadiah, 
who all published their writings around the same time. Isaiah wrote his prophecy after his contemporaries. However, the prophecy of Isaiah is placed first among the prophet section in the canon of scripture due to its size and because it bears such a great testimony to our Lord Jesus Christ. Isaiah's prophecy centred upon two major events in Judah's history. The first was the invasion of Sennacherib, which happened during his lifetime. The second was the Babylonian captivity, which happened after his death. However, while Isaiah prophesied these two events, his focus was beyond the physical deliverance of the church from their enemies. Isaiah's prophecy was Christocentric. Often throughout church history, the prophet Isaiah has been referred to as the evangelical prophet. His prophecy has often been called the fifth gospel, such is its revelation of Jesus Christ. As we read Isaiah chapter 53, we see such a detailed description and explanation of the sacrificial death of our Saviour, we could well be reading a gospel narrative. The prophecy of Isaiah is considered to be in two parts. The first 39 chapters details God's hatred for sin and brings the threat of judgment upon the nation with the invasion of Sennacherib and the Babylonian captivity. The second part of the book, from chapter 40 onwards, details the comforting promises God gives to his people and his church. Before we come to consider one of the promises, let us look a little closer at the context in which they were given. In the third year of Jehoiakim, Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, arrived at Jerusalem with a great army and quickly besieged the city. The sanctuary was ransacked and the vessels of the sanctuary were carried away to Babylon, where they were placed in the temple of Belus and dedicated to Belmarduk, the Babylonian god of war. The treasures of King Jehoiakim now belong to Nebuchadnezzar. Daniel and his companions were transported to Babylon to be brought up in the learning of the Chaldeans. King Jehoiakim was spared his life if he served as a subordinate to Nebuchadnezzar. Thus began the 70 years of captivity. Jehoiakim rebelled and Nebuchadnezzar returned to Jerusalem to put him to death. Nebuchadnezzar placed Jehoiachin, the son of Jehoiakim, on the throne of Judah, but he also rebelled. And Nebuchadnezzar returned to Jerusalem for a third time, taking the king and 10,000 more people captive to Babylon. Mataniah, the uncle of Jehoiachin, is now made king of Judah under the name Zedekiah. Once again, Nebuchadnezzar returned to Jerusalem, takes Zedekiah prisoner, puts out his eyes and lays waste to Jerusalem. The city was stripped of anything of value. The walls of the city were pulled down and the city was set on fire. The royal palaces are gone. The temple is gone. The rest of the people were carried away to captivity in Babylon in the third and final deportation of the Jewish captives. A few of the poorest people were left to work the ground. But Jerusalem was unrecognisable. The city of God is now the city of desolation. It is against this coming judgment that Isaiah writing under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, gives the promises of comfort. Isaiah is writing approximately 100 years before the start of the captivity. He foretells the horror of captivity, but he brings the comforting promises that God will bring deliverance. Quite often this is how the Lord deals with his people. There's one promise I want us to look at today. This is not a promise specific to the church in captivity, it is a universal truth that is relevant and applicable in every age. It's verse 8. The grass withereth, the flower fadeth, but the word of our God shall stand forever. Three things I want you to notice about what I call the enduring word. First of all, the contrast. Too often, the church in the Old Testament dispensation had become obsessed with the carnal. They wanted an image of God which they could see with their eyes, so Aaron made a golden calf. They wanted a king to be like the other nations, so God gave them Saul. Their affections, desires and lusts 
we're often focused upon the earthly and not the heavenly. In this promise, God is showing the temporal nature of earthly things. He states, The grass withereth, the flower fadeth. These are things we know to be true. We have observed them with our own eyes. We can watch the trees blossom in spring with beautiful leaves and flowers, but come autumn, those leaves have died, fallen, on the, or fallen off the tree, and are decaying on the ground. But this doesn't just happen to plants and trees. It happens to other items. The finest gold watches will one day break down. The finest buildings ever erected will over time become dilapidated. The strongest military ever assembled will eventually suffer defeat or be disbanded. The same can be said of people. The kings and rulers of the earth may have their season of power. The celebrities may have their five minutes of fame. The sports star may win his medal, but they too will succumb to the inevitable. They will wither and fade from this world. The Apostle James comments, For what is your life? It is even a vapour that appeareth for a little time and then vanisheth away. James chapter 4 verse 14. Solomon said, I have seen all the works that are done under the sun, and behold, all is vanity and vexation of spirit. Ecclesiastes 1 verse 14. Even Jerusalem, with its strong walls and king's palaces, and the temple for the worship of God, is shown to be as temporary as the rest of the world. If we only had the first part of this verse, it would leave us quite distressed. Nothing is permanent. Nothing is secure. Nothing can be relied upon. However, that is where the contrast comes in. After showing us how impermanent all the things of this world are, we are brought to see that there is one thing that is permanent, trustworthy, reliable and steadfast. The word of our God. Trees will wither and fade. Kingdoms will wither and fade. Men will wither and fade. But there is one thing that will endure in the face of death, decay and destruction. And it is the word of our God. The word of our God shall stand forever. Very simply, God's word is not temporary or provisional. It is not subject to the same deterioration as all other things in the world. God's word is eternal. The counsel of the Lord standeth forever. The thoughts of his heart to all generations. Psalm 33 verse 11. Psalm 119 89 says, Forever, O Lord, thy word is settled in heaven. Mark 13 verse 31. The Saviour said, Heaven and earth shall pass away, but my words shall not pass away. Peter says, Being born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible, by the word of God, which liveth and abideth for ever. For all flesh is as grass, and the glory of man is the flower of grass. The grass withereth, and the flower thereof falleth away, but the word of the Lord endureth for ever. 1 Peter 1, 24 The psalmist said in Psalm 119, 152, Concerning thy testimonies I have known of old, Thou hast founded them forever. Adolf Hitler and the Nazi party in Germany were widely ambitious and confident in their plans for what they called the Third Reich. A belief they held to was what they call in German Tausend Jahrgis, which translates Thousand Year Reich. As confident and deluded as the Nazis were, even they saw that no state could last forever. In the eyes of the Nazis, even the Nazi state would one day come to an end. Today, we can look around and see the same limitations in the world. Nothing is permanent. Nothing lasts forever. Everything is limited by time. We can see this with the mobile phones we buy or the cars we drive. While they might last a long time, they won't last forever. We can examine the span of human history and see how the kingdoms of the Greeks, the Turks, the Romans and even the British have come and gone. Great politicians, authors, musicians, humanitarians, preachers all return to the dust from whence they came. This is why we're not to set our hope in the temporal but in the eternal. 
in that which will stand forever. When everything else in this world falls apart, we can set our faith and trust in the word of God. So that's the contrast. Notice secondly, the continuation. In stating how the word of our God shall stand forever, the prophet is not trying to champion an emotional, loyal spirit in the face of reality. Whatever the prophet is stating is a certain and absolute fact. The word of our God shall stand forever. Think of the opposition the word of God has faced throughout history. First of all, there was satanic opposition. We saw that firstly in the Garden of Eden, Genesis chapter 3. Satan began by questioning the word of God. Verse 1. Now the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said unto the woman, Yea, hath God said, Ye shall not eat of every tree of the garden? So Satan questioned the word. And then he cast doubt in the word in verse 4. And the serpent said unto the woman, Ye shall not surely die. And then Satan replaced the word of God. For God doth know that in the day ye eat thereof, then your eyes shall be opened, and ye shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. Verse 5 of Genesis 3. And then we see another example with our Saviour in the wilderness. Luke chapter 4, verses 9 to 11. We see that Satan is familiar with scripture, for he quotes Psalm 91 to the Saviour. But notice that Satan alters the meaning of the word of God. Psalm 91 is a promise of divine security to those who walk with God and obey him. It is not a promise that God will look after us if we do something careless, like jump off a building. Notice then that Satan omits the word of God in this passage in Luke chapter 4. In quoting Psalm 91 verses 11 to 12, Satan omits the words, in all thy ways. We can then notice that Satan doesn't only omit the word of God, <clears throat> he makes additions to the word of God as well. He adds the words at any time to his quotation of Psalm 91. In the parable of the sower, in Matthew chapter 13, Satan is the one who comes along and steals the word of God. When anyone heareth the word of the kingdom, and understandeth it not, then cometh the wicked one, and catcheth away that which was sown in his heart. This is he which receive seed by the wayside. That's Matthew 13, verse 19. But the word of God continues, despite the attempts of Satan, but it continues also despite the rejection of men. Prior to the flood, there were only eight people who believed the word of God. A very small percentage by the world's standards, and yet the word of God still endured. With Abraham and his seed, there was again a small percentage of believers, and yet the word of God endured. During the periods of the judges and the kings, during the periods of captivity, during the many times of unbelief and apostasy, the word of God endured. It stood through it all. Even today, God's word is mocked and scorned by infidels and unbelievers. It is castigated as a relic of a past age. It is blamed for the sinful actions of men. It is even used to affront the name and character of God himself. Yet despite all this, the word of our God continues to stand. As we examine the span of human history, countless billions have rejected the word of God, and yet it still endures. The ideas of men fade into the annals of history when they are rejected, but God's word continues to stand, though it be rejected by many. The word of God endures also, despite the attempts to corrupt the word. This, of course, is part of the master plan of Satan. But we speak now of the human instruments who are involved in this corruption. It appears that God's word 
is attacked from every front. Liberals seek to corrupt the word by denying it is the word of God. They cast doubts about its authenticity. They reject the supernatural events recorded in its pages. They deny the deity, the person and work of our Lord Jesus Christ. It is a wonder they even bother with the Bible when they find all these faults with it. Then we have the modern day wolves in sheep's clothing, who tell us they are going to help improve the word of God by giving us the most accurate translations. But really, they are going to undermine it, cast aspersions about its origin and text, and shake our confidence in it. We could include also the cults, with their additions to the word of God, with their own uninspired writings. The Book of Mormon, the Watchtower magazine, the writings of Ellen G. White, the Koran, we could go on. The list is endless of all those throughout history who have sought to corrupt the word of God. And yet, the word of our God continues to stand today. In 1526, copies of William Tyndale's New Testament began arriving on the shores of England in bales of cloth and barrels of flour. Bishop Tunstall soon discovered he couldn't stop the scriptures arriving, so he devised a new plan. He would buy all the copies of scripture and burn them. Despite the political and financial muscle of the Church of Rome behind him, his plan failed. Unbeknown to the bishop, he was funding the printing of further copies of Tyndale's New Testament. Christians don't need to fear the news channels. We don't need to fear governments or armies or pressure groups and all the threats they make to eradicate the word of God. Should all the governments of the world unite to ban the printing of scripture and burn every copy, their plan would be an utter failure because God has promised the word of our God shall stand forever. So we've thought of the contrast, the continuation, think finally of the confidence. And we're thinking of the believer's confidence in the word of God. These words were designed by God to comfort the first recipients of the prophecy of Isaiah, the church in the Babylonian captivity. God intended to show them how they could trust his unfailing word. He gave his word to comfort them in the 70 miserable years of captivity. He gave his word to comfort them that he had not cast them off or abandoned them. His word was to be their beacon of hope as they looked forward to the coming of the Redeemer and the expansion of his kingdom. These words were given to guide. Psalm 119 verse 105 says, Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. The word of God is a guide to us. The word of God was also given to revive us. Psalm 119 verse 50. This is my comfort in my affliction for thy word hath quickened me. The word of God was given for our hope, so we could hope in it and have hope and assurance. Psalm 119, verse 81, My soul fainteth for thy salvation, but I hope in thy word. We can have confidence in the word of God because it has promised to succeed. Isaiah 55, verse 11, So shall my word be that goeth forth out of my mouth. It shall not return unto me void, but it shall accomplish that which I please, and it shall prosper in the thing whereto I sent it. Numbers 23, verse 19, God is not a man that he should lie, neither the son of man that he should repent. Hath he said, and shall he not do it? Or hath he spoken, and shall he not make good? We can have confidence that the word of God will succeed as God has intended. God's word will be fulfilled. Matthew 5 verse 18 the Saviour said, For verily I say unto you, till heaven and earth pass away, one jot or one tittle shall in no wise pass from the law till all be fulfilled. The word of God we can have confidence in it because it has power 
Hebrews 4 verse 10, 12 says, For the word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword. Jeremiah 23 verse 29 Is not my word like a fire, saith the Lord, and like a hammer that breaketh a rock in pieces? There's no book as powerful in this world as the word of God. In Acts chapter 4, we read of two men called Peter and John. They had such confidence in the veracity of this book that they were willing to go to prison for it. In Acts chapter 7, we read of a young man called Stephen, who had the utmost confidence in this book. He preached it with such boldness that he was stoned to death for his faith. In Acts chapter 12, the apostle James, brother of John, was martyred with the sword because he believed this book. Time restricts me from telling you the story of every martyr of Jesus Christ, but the story is the same. They love not their lives unto the death. Revelation 12, verse 11. God has given his word for our good, so we can trust him and have that full confidence that whatsoever God has ordained, it will come to pass. Our unbelief is directly linked to a lack of trust in God's word. Unbelief manifests itself in a number of ways. First, there is worrying when we become agitated about factors beyond our control, factors that God has stated in his word that he is in control of. We are guilty of unbelief. There was an old Irish preacher who said, I would as soon get drunk as worry. He went on to say, drunkenness might be more vulgar, but worry is pure blasphemy. You might think that sounds extreme, but think about the deep roots of worrying and you'll conclude that it's unbelief and ultimately it's a lack of belief and that it's blasphemy against God. In order for a person to have confidence in the word of God, they must be familiar with the word of God. When you go for a medical procedure, you might be anxious because you don't know what is going to happen. Once the doctor or nurse explains the details of that procedure and how often the doctor has done it, you feel more relaxed. In order to have faith in God, you need to know God, who he is, what he has done, what he is going to do, what he is able to do. That only comes by spending time in his word. The best thing about Holy Scripture is that it testifies of our Redeemer. John 5.39, search the Scriptures, for in them ye think ye have eternal life, and they are they which testify of me. Scripture is all about Jesus Christ from beginning to end. And Scripture shows us that Christ is eternal, that he was uh, that he has always been and that he always will be. He was there before the foundation of the world. He is the one who called all things into being. Scripture shows us his electing grace. It goes on to show us his, his perfect obedience, his sinless life. It shows us his atoning death. It shows us his, his bodily resurrection, his glorious ascension. It tells us of his intercession at the right hand of God. Scripture shows us God the Holy Spirit blessing the church and the Holy Spirit comforting the people of God. Dear friends, because the word of our God shall stand forever, the work of our Saviour shall stand forever. All that the Father giveth me shall come to me, and him that cometh to me I will in no wise cast out. John six thirty seven. And this is the Father's will which hath sent me. That of all which he hath given me, I should lose nothing, but raise it up again at the last day. Dear friend, our confidence is to be in the enduring word. Because the word of our God shall stand forever.
Amharic is spoken by around 26 million people. It is mainly spoken in Ethiopia, a landlocked country in the Horn of Africa. It is the official language of Ethiopia, and speakers also live in countries such as Eritrea, Egypt, Israel, and the USA. There are around 26 million Amharic speakers globally. Over 21.6 million of these live in Ethiopia, and it is the second most spoken Semitic language in the world after Arabic. Ethiopia is Africa's oldest independent country and its second largest in terms of population. Drought and civil conflict left Ethiopia in a state of turmoil under a Marxist dictatorship from the fall of the monarchy in 1974 until 1991. Ethiopia used to have a substantial African Jewish population known as Beta Israel. However, the majority of Jews moved to Israel during the 20th century. It is thought that Ethiopia was one of the first Christian countries in the world. The Kingdom of Aksum, present-day Ethiopia, having officially adopted Christianity as their religion in the 4th century. Sadly, the majority of these are Ethiopian Orthodox, who believe in the heresy monophysitism, the belief that Christ had only one nature, which was divine. Ethiopia is a predominantly Christian country, surrounded by Muslim countries. Roughly two-thirds of people who live in Ethiopia identify as a Christian of some sort, and one-third as Muslim. A census carried out in 2007 showed that 43% of the population identified as Ethiopian Orthodox Christian, 33% identified as Muslim, 18% identified as Protestant Christian. A remaining small minority identified with traditional animist beliefs or other religions, including Catholicism. There are seven versions of the Amharic Bible currently in use. The 1886 Abba Ruby Bible is good in many respects and is close to the authorised version, but its use of terms such as Saturday instead of Sabbath has been used by the Seventh-day Adventists to persuade people that the Sabbath is Saturday. Synagogue was also translated as mosque, and there are other such problems such as very old usages of words. The other six versions all use the modern critical text and have many deletions and omissions. For example, 1 John chapter 5 verse 7 is missing in all six versions, and the subtraction of God from 1 Timothy chapter 3 verse 16. One of the six is a direct translation of the New International Version, another is a Jehovah's Witness version, and another is an Orthodox Church translation from the Septuagint and containing the apocryphal books within the canonical books. There is a need to publish an accurate, reliable Amharic Bible, which can be read by Amharic speakers around the world. The Amharic speakers need a new version of the Bible, which is translated from the Greek Textus Receptus for the New Testament and the Masoretic Hebrew text for the Old Testament. A new, reliable version, free from error and misrepresentation, is important in order that believers can receive sound teaching and be established on solid doctrine rather than confusion. The TBS commenced this translation project in 2012. The translator is a native Amharic speaker from Ethiopia. He has recently immigrated to the United States of America, where he is the pastor of a church there. He is in contact with Amharic proofreaders, both in his own church and in the United Kingdom. In 2014, the TBS General Committee approved the Gospel According to John for publication. This was published in 2015, and nearly 100,000 copies were shipped to Ethiopia. 
These were distributed in September 2015. There were difficulties getting the Gospels into the country, and extortionate levies and fees totalling £15,000 had to be paid for transportation, import and custom duties, taxes and storage. The first draft of the entire New Testament was completed by January 2018. Shortly after this, the translator and his wife were involved in a serious road accident requiring hospitalisation and surgery. Mercifully, both were spared, although the translator's wife still suffers side effects. The translator spent the next 12 months reviewing the first draft of the New Testament and in late 2018 he started work in the Psalms. In early 2020, a group of native Amharic speakers in Ethiopia spent two weeks intensively proofreading the draft New Testament in Psalms. It is hoped that, if the Lord will, 15,000 Amharic New Testament and Psalms will be printed in 2021. I am Haile Luul Tafara Emiru. I am from Ethiopia and I'm undertaking a Bible translation in Amharic language. Amharic language is the official language of the nation of Ethiopia. The New Testament translation started in 2012 uh, and it was appointed uh, to be translated by Trinitarian Bible Society. Uh, the New Testament is actually finished with the book of Psalm of David. Uh, we have translations, there, there are about seven of them in Amharic language, but uh, six of them are based on modern critical text, and the only one that is from Textus Receptus is the oldest one and it doesn't communicate the truth for modern readers. The underlying text uh, I'm using is the Textus Receptus, and I'm using, uh, when I'm translating, I'm using the green interlinear as uh, a reference uh, from Greek di directly translated to English. I'm not using the other source, which is based on Alan Nestle underlying text. When I came to translate the um, Psalm of David from the Old Testament, I found the Psalm of David is translated from Septuagint resource. In the Psalm of David, you can see so many differences. Some of the differences are really shocking. Uh, and doctrinal as well. Uh, for example, wherever there is a particular phrase which says, O Lord, O capital L O R D, which refers to Jehovah, um, it, it, is, it is translated just O in Amharic. The Lord that is particularly referring to God, Jehovah, is omitted. You can, if you count it, it is, it is more than 100 times. Uh, so this Amharic translation is really vital for preaching the gospel and teaching people the sound teaching of uh, the Bible. In 2015, the Society partnered with the Free Grace Evangelistic Association to prepare an interim Chichewa New Testament. Chichewa is the most widely known language of Malawi. It is spoken chiefly in its central and southern regions. It is also spoken in parts of Mozambique and Zimbabwe, 
in addition to being one of the seven official African languages of Zambia, where it is spoken mostly in the eastern province. There are over 12 million speakers of Chichewa. The potential usefulness of this language for the scriptures is therefore widespread. Most Chichewa speakers live in Malawi. Malawi has a population of approximately 17.5 million people and nine official languages, of which Chichewa is the most widely spoken. Malawi is a nominally Christian country. Around 87% of the population professes to be Christian. The two largest denominations are the Roman Catholic Church and the Church of Central Africa Presbyterian. There are also many other denominations and small independent churches. There is a significant Muslim minority. The first completed New Testament in Chichewa was translated by W. H. Murray in 1909 and the entire Chichewa Bible was translated in Zambia by W. P. Johnson in 1912. This is known as the Buku Lupa Tulika and was first published in 1922. It was revised in 1936 and again in 1966. There are also several other translations, including those by the Roman Catholic Church and the Jehovah's Witnesses. All of these are based on the critical text with a variety of textual and translation problems. Some might be curious. Why are we translating and publishing another Bible when there are already several in print? Here are five brief reasons. Firstly, the current Chichewa translations are from the revised version of 1885. A new version is needed that is faithful to the original languages, the Masoretic Hebrew and the Greek Textus Receptus. Secondly, the language used in the current Chichewa Bibles is gender neutral. For example, John chapter 3 verse 16 reads, Only begotten child. A scripture makes clear distinctions with gender. Care must be taken. The translations also make this distinction. Thirdly, there are translation mistakes. One example is the account of our Saviour rebuking his disciples in the Garden of Gethsemane. Matthew chapter 26 verse 40 reads, Pray with me one minute, when it should read one hour. Fourthly, there are theological errors. In Romans chapter 8 verse 4 it reads ordinance of the law when it should read righteousness of the law. Fifthly, current Bibles produce readings that are different from the English and from other translations. In many churches the practice is to read the same passage from the English authorised version and the local Chichewa. This brought confusion to the churches when both languages were read in a church service as the readings were often contrary one from another. One translator comments upon receiving the TBS Chichewa New Testament, It's easy to understand. We can read it in English and read it in Chichewa and it is the same. A new version is needed that is faithful to the original languages. Due to the lack of Chichewa speakers, who can translate directly from the Koine Greek, the translation is being carried out with primary reference to the English authorised version and a received text interlinear along with the Strong's Strongest Concordance. We hope that this interim project, based on the authorised version, will lead to a new translation of the Chichewa Bible directly from the Hebrew Masoretic and Greek received text. The TBS have been working together with the Free Grace Evangelistic Association. The translation work is led by a native Chichewa speaker from Malawi, with reviewers taken from both Zambia and Malawi. A Malawian minister who studied at a reformed seminary in the USA has provided detailed review comments. 5,000 copies of the New Testament have been printed and are presently being distributed. However, Many more copies are needed to reach such a large number of Chichewa speakers. Work on the Old Testament is in progress and hopes to be ready in 2022.
This is a team uh, which received the New Testament in Chichewa for distribution in their local churches deep in the villages here in uh, Petauke. Even where we are, it is under the trees where we made uh, these servants of God. Yeah, I'm a passer. I'm a passer,